Well, track down a Bible and get with, with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, we'll be looking at verses 13 to 20. I will read it, we'll pray, and we'll get to work. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Let's pray. Lord, right now we're asking that as we've opened your word together that you, by your Spirit, through that word, would speak to us. We want to hear your voice loud and clear. Lord, we want help as we consider making these decisions about surrendering our lives to you and walking in your way. Help us, Lord, to recognize the significance of these choices and then help us to have wisdom to discern whether or not people are helping us in that journey or hindering us. So, Lord, we commit this time to you. We ask that you would have your way with it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The thing that's going on here is Jesus is concluding his sermon. So he's landing the plane, and he's helping us to consider how we might respond to it. And in fact, what he's doing is he's calling for a decision. Having presented this material on what it's like to live life in the kingdom, he's now pressing it home and going, will you respond with obedience and faith. Will you take what you've heard and now allow it to be a dominating feature of your hearts and lives? In other words, he's a good preacher. Having done this sermon, he's now saying, I don't just want you to have information. I want you to be transformed. I want you to respond with faith to what I have presented, Jesus is saying. And what he does then is he takes this concept, and he hammers it home with four negative examples. And he's saying, you have to make a decision, but beware that there there is a way to mishandle this. So he gives four negative examples. We're going to take two this week. Lord willing, we'll do the last two next week, and we'll conclude the the sermon on the Mount series at the uh, next weekend. But he says these four different things. Not every journey concludes in the heavenly city. Not every path that people take will land them in the heavenly city. Secondly, he says, not every, not every spiritual teacher will give you helpful instruction. Not everyone who claims to communicate on behalf of God will actually give you the information that you need and the help along the way for you to arrive safely. Then he says, not everyone who claims to be a Christian is in fact a Christian. Not everyone who professes to follow Jesus actually is following him. And finally, not every worldview or ideology, not every worldview is worthy of building your life upon. So four different examples, and he's saying you have to make a choice, but beware that the stakes are very, very high. Choose whether or not you are going to listen to the voice of the Lord and allow it to be the dominating factor of your lives. He is telling us that there is a choice to be made, and he is not leaving a mushy middle for us. He's not saying you could take or leave Christianity. It's, it's you know, something that you might kind of associate with. He's saying this has to become the, the dominating feature of your life. You have to choose to respond with faith to what Jesus has presented, or the other option is pretty grim. So first off, the kingdom citizenship has a specific entry point, verses 13 and 14. Kingdom citizenship has a specific point of entry. Look with me again at verses 13 and 14. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. 
But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. He's saying there is a particular way in which you can come into this pathway of life with God. And there really are only two choices. So one of the questions that is pretty dominant in our culture is, do all roads somehow lead to God? Do all roads somehow lead to God? Now, there, this is a very popular concept in our culture as we look at all the different variety of experiences that people might have and we come to the conclusion, what if everyone is on their own journey and somehow we'll all arrive at the same destination? I, had a, I have a buddy named Clay. He's from, he's from Carrollton, Georgia, and uh, he's just a southern dude, so just steeped in, in uh, that southern mentality. He's so laid back. He's like the chillest person I've ever met. He's like the, the human version of a golden retriever. He's just a very <laughs> chill individual. And when I was down in Orlando, he was living there at the time, and, and uh, I would be, you know, if we're going somewhere, he's more familiar with the area, so he's co-piloting for me, and I'd say, okay, Clay, um, you got you to gotta get us there, you know, so you just tell me where to turn, and, you know, I'll follow your lead, and so we're in the car, and we're driving around Orlando, and I'll say, do I need to turn up here? And he'll say, yeah, you could turn here. <laughs> And, you know, so I'd make a turn, and then I'd be driving, we'd be chit-chatting, and then I'd go, should I be turning here? And he goes, yeah, you could turn here. And it just went on and on, and I began to realize, oh, this dude, he understands that you can continue turning as long as you want. Eventually, you're going to get there. And he's just so laid back that for him, I mean, obviously, he had ideas if he were driving of the way in which he would take to to get to a particular destination, but he was okay with just going for a car ride. And eventually, you're going to turn to the street that you need to be on, and you're going to arrive there. Now, that mentality for him, that was just a part of who he was, but, but it has become, that idea has become a popular idea in our society. That when we think about spirituality, that, that vibe, that, that ethos, that really is how a lot of people deal with matters of spirituality. Is there a way to God? Well, Culturally speaking, many people would say there's probably a lot of ways to God. There's a lot of different pathways that could get you to that spiritual destination. So m- many of us kind of grew up in, you know, the American Western Christian society. And so we believe Christianity is the way. But what if you didn't have that experience? What if you grew up in a different culture and in a different environment? What if you had a different upbringing, a different background? Couldn't, couldn't you have some spiritual experience that would also get you to that destination of life with God? So it's a legitimate question because, you know, in our culture now, a lot of people are saying, you know, maybe, I, maybe I'll deconstruct my childhood faith. Maybe I'll try a different way. Maybe what I've been raised to believe is inaccurate and maybe there's a different way. I mean, I still care about spiritual things, but do I have to follow God in this particular way? Well, Jesus here is saying that there is an actual way to God, and it is not up for debate. He's telling us that there are not many ways that lead to God. There is a way. There is a singular way in which we can come to know God as he truly is, and he's calling us then to come to that place of decision. He's saying there aren't many roads that all lead to God. There's only two roads And those two roads don't both lead to God. One leads to destruction, the other leads to life. So there is a choice to be made. Which road will you travel? Which path are you going to take? Which gate are you going to enter by? And which destination are you going to arrive at? But Jesus is saying there really is only two ways. One leads to life with God, the other to destruction. So you have to choose. Again, there's no mushy middle. He's not saying you can think on this one a little bit. You can take your time with it. He's saying, no, this is the option. There is a way that leads to life. There is a way that leads to death, and you have to choose. So he's putting it before us today. What kind of life are you going to live? What choice are you going to make? Choose today what your life is going to be built upon. This is very similar to what Moses did in the book of Deuteronomy. I think commentators were right to make the comparisons. Moses went up Mount Sinai. He got the word of the Lord. He brought it to the people. 
he led the people, and, went, and then in Deuteronomy, he, he basically preaches a batch of sermons uh, right before they're going to enter into the promised land. And Jesus now is teaching the Sermon on the Mount, and there's a lot of similarities between what Moses was saying back then and what Jesus is saying here today. But Moses, at the end of his sermons, he did the same thing. He came to a conclusion and he said, you actually have to do something with this. You have to onboard this teaching in a way that will change you. So in Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, he puts it like this. He says, see, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Here's what, here's what it boils down to. You have to choose. I'm putting before you an option and you really only have this one choice to make, but this is the most significant choice that you could make. Verse 19 goes on to say, Moses says, This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. That's the invitation that Moses made. It's the invitation that Jesus is making even today. Today you have a choice. Will you choose the way of life that God is inviting you into? Will you choose to take the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount and base your entire existence upon it? Will you entrust yourself to the King himself and believe his message? But the choice is being set before you today. There are only two options. A narrow road leading to life or a wide and broad road leading to destruction so which will you choose? Now, one of the follow-up questions that we often have when, when we're presented with a choice like this is, what does that mean for me? And specifically, we might say, will it be easy or hard? If you're forcing me to make a decision today, I want to know what the outcome might look like. Will it be easy or hard? Will this way of following you, will this path lead me down you know, difficult places that I have to traverse, or will it just be a life of relative ease? Is it worth it? It sounds like you're calling me to this radical reorientation of my entire life, but is it, is it going to be hard? And Jesus does not pull any punches here. He does not soft sell his messaging here. He makes it very plain. It will be hard. He tells us that this is not an easy thing. In fact, some of the language that's used here in verse 13. In our version, the NIV, it didn't, it didn't pick this up, but in other versions like the ESV, it notes that Jesus uses a particular word that means easy or conversely hard. So in verse 13, he says, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. It's easy. That's the easy path. But Jesus is saying, no, this narrow road, this narrow path, this small point of entry, this way of following. No, that, that will be hard. That, that will be costly. Jesus has a, a history of teaching this message. He, when people say to him, I, I will follow you, he says, really? Like this one dude who came to him and said, Jesus, anywhere you go, I'll be there. And he goes, are you sure? Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, he has no place to, to rest his head. It's like, I know you, dude. You like your bed. And so when the individual is saying, I'll follow you wherever, he says, are you sure? Because it will be hard. In other places, he says, count the cost. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a pastor during the time of Nazi Germany, he actually wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And he, he famously said this. He says, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. There is a cost to following Jesus, and, and it will be hard. It is absolute surrender to him, and it is a life of difficulty. It is a life of incredible difficulty, but it is worth it. It is absolutely worth it, but you need to know what you're signing on for. You need to understand that this is the gig. When the apostles were encouraging the churches that they helped to plant, they went back through the, the regions. This is the apostle Paul and his traveling companion Barnabas, and and they go back to these churches that were being persecuted on account of their faith, and they encouraged them. But it was a very strange word of encouragement. This is Acts 14, 22. They said, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. He basically reminds them, this is what you signed on for. 
This is what it is. This is following the Lord who went to a cross for us. So this difficulty is something that Jesus is not trying to hide from us. He's making it very plain. There's a choice to be made, and that choice will result in a difficult way of life, but it is worth it. I love how C.S. Lewis puts it. He says, um, he says, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, certainly, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. He recognizes this, this call to discipleship, it is a demanding call, and it will be full of challenges, but it is worth it. So Jesus is saying there's a choice to be made. One leads to life, the other to death. The one leading to life will be hard. Are you willing to make that sort of sacrifice? But now my question is, how does somebody enter this way of life? How might somebody become a Christian? Jesus is clearly teaching that there really is only one way. If you're familiar with Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. It's a, it's a story, it's an allegory where uh, it's a story about the Christian journey, and every character is a, an aspect of the Christian experience, and so you've got Christian on his way to the heavenly city, and then he interacts with all these different people, and at the front end of the book, he's, uh, he interacts with a person called Evangelist who's sharing the good news of the gospel with him and telling him how he might enter into the path of the way to the heavenly city. And evangelist tells him, there is a, there's a gate. And he tells him, it is over there, and you have to go across this field. Do not go in any other direction. Go directly to that gate where you will find admittance into the, into the way of the, this path to the city of God. And he listens to the evangelist, and he makes some missteps along the way, but he, he gets to the door, and he knocks on it, and he's, he's gladly received and he starts his Christian pilgrimage there, and he be, he's now walking along the way. And then as the story unfolds, there are other people who come into the path, but they jump over the fence. And they have a very, very different experience from Christian. And Jesus is teaching that very message today. He's saying there is a way to come into this reality of spiritual contact with God. But it is the way and the only way that God has made available to us. So will you choose that way? Now, here's the, so here's my question. I've been thinking about it this week. Core, make it plain. How can <clears throat> our kids, hearing this message, become Christians? How is it that we come into this path that Jesus is talking about? This is a, this is a metaphorical language. And I, and I just want to be as clear as I possibly can be. If somebody is saying to me, or let's say Harrison, if Harrison says to me, my, my six-year-old son, if he says, Dad, how do I become a Christian? How do I enter this way of life that you're talking about? Jesus is, is telling us it's him. The choice that we're making today is really him. Do we choose Jesus? The entry point into this path is the Lord himself. In the book of John, he takes both of those different metaphors and he applies them directly to him. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. So we're, we're making a decision then about whether or not we trust him and believe in him. He's the way, and no one comes to the Father except through him. In John chapter 10, verse 9, he says, this is Jesus again, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He's the, the door by which we enter into life with God, and it is through him that we enter and are saved. So if you want to know, how do you get on this pathway to the city of God? How do you enter by way of the right method that God has made for us, it is him. It is Jesus Christ crucified and risen. Do you believe in him? Do you entrust yourself to him? That's why the apostles were willing to put it like this in Acts 4, 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There is one way, one way, and that way is Jesus Christ alone. 
So will you receive him? Will you believe on him for salvation? So the kingdom has a specific entry point, but it also has a specific content. It has teaching that is helpful. So the second thing that we find here in our passage is that the kingdom of heaven has specific teaching that will get us further along in the path, but we need to be aware then that there are those who are not teaching that truth. So there's a choice being made not only about how we're going to come into this path, but also about the kind of people who are talking about that choice. Because there are some people who are going to communicate about God in a way that brings about misinformation. So Jesus is saying not everyone who claims to communicate on behalf of God can be trusted. This is a tricky concept, but he's introducing this idea of false prophets and false teaching. Look at verse 15. Watch out for false prophets. If you've got this significant choice that needs to be made, and then you need to accompany that choice by teaching that will help you along the way, you need to be very, very careful here. Beware of false prophets. There is such a thing as a communicator who is misleading people. There is a concept called false teaching. It shows up in almost every New Testament letter. It was a major theme in the, in the New Testament scriptures. And my perspective is it didn't vanish in thin air. It wasn't just a first century issue. We got it all sorted out now and we're all good. No, no, no. It's pervasive. It continues to be an issue that plagues the church. So watch out for false prophets. False prophets are people who claim to speak for God. Uh, Jeremiah 23 is a really good place to understand false prophecy. Um, we don't have time to go into all the details, but here are some of the features of false prophets. They claim to speak for God. They, they are saying that, they, that God has told them to relay this information. They enjoy the audience that they have as people listen to them and hang on their every words. They speak. This is, what, this is what God says in Jeremiah 23. They speak from their own imaginations, not from sitting with God and listening to the voice of God. And the content of their messaging is peace without God. Jeremiah 23, verse 17, we'll put it up on the screen. This is the, this is the message of false prophets. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. Here's the message of false prophets then. You can do life just as you're doing it. You're going to be fine. The Lord says you can, you can have this peace. You don't have to make any adjustments here. You don't have to accommodate your life to the truth of the gospel. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're fine just being yourself. And it goes on to say, if those prophets would have stood in the counsel of the Lord they would have warned God's people to turn. If they would have actually sat and listened to the voice of God, they would have said, no, 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 you need to make a decision here. You need to choose to follow God. You need to return to the way of the Lord. So false teachers are people who are muddying up that choice that we have to consistently make. They're misleading us. They're misinforming us, and they do great harm. So how can we discern false teaching? So you're going to cruise into Barnes & Noble. I guess that's probably not very realistic. You're going to be, you're going to be online, um, and there's going to be all this Christian, Christian content, and you have to decide, whose voice do I trust? This is a tricky thing. I mean, have you thought through this? There's all kinds of Christian messaging out there, and Jesus is saying not all of it is good. In fact, some of it is straight-out false so how do you discern true and false teaching? How do, you, how do you make that decision? How do you come to the conclusion that somebody is misleading you? And this metaphor here that Jesus says points out that it's intrinsically tricky. False teachers do not advertise that they're false teachers. Verse 15, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. They're not, they're not coming at you in a way where you go, oh, this is obvious. They've got their name badge on here. They're the false teacher. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if when you're on YouTube, which this one is super frustrating to me, is an algorithm of a way that it just gives you stuff that you, they think you want to hear. 
And false teaching is an issue on YouTube, big time. Wouldn't it be nice if when you're scrolling through your YouTube feed, it actually just has a little subtitle at the bottom, asterisk, this is a false teaching. Wouldn't that be helpful? And you go, oh, you know what, I could pass on that one. You just keep scrolling. But that's not the case. They don't wear a name badge. They don't advertise. In fact, John Stott puts it like this. A false teacher does not announce or advertise as a purveyor of lies. On the contrary, they claim to be teachers of truth. So they're coming to us in sheep's clothing. They look like believers. They seem to be sincere, but inwardly they're ferocious ferocious wolves doing great harm. So how do we deal with false prophets and false teachers and the danger thereof? Well, Jesus tells us, examine their fruit. Verse 16, by their fruit, you will recognize them. The, the produce of their lives, what they are producing will reveal the kind of teacher that they truly are, and you need to treat them accordingly, which is what the analogy goes on to explain. Verse 16, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? You don't go to a weed and expect to have this amazing harvest. You don't go to a weed and expect for it to give you the fruit that you're looking to eat. You, you, you remove those things from your garden. So when you find someone to be a false teacher and you understand their nature and the sorts of things that they're producing, you need to be the kind of person who diligently removes their, their voice from your life. So he says, what the tree is reveals what the tree produces, verses 17 and 18. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot, cannot bear good fruit. So it's saying what they are reveals what they produce, or looking at it from the other direction, what they're producing reveals who they truly are. So how do, so how do we examine fruit? Let me give you three different ideas. Fruit can mean all kinds of different things here. In this passage, I, mean, I think it means pretty much everything that results from this way of teaching. So the first thing that we need to do is look at their teaching. Is what they are saying in line with the Scripture? Is what they are saying in line with what the Bible actually presents? And this one, it's not super easy either. Because every heresy has a verse. When people are teaching falsely, they're using the Bible. So you can't just say, oh, it's got a footnote on here from Scripture. Must be good. No, no, no. False teaching is, all, is often the misapplication of Scripture. So you need to be familiar with what the Bible is seeking to communicate, what God is really saying, and that's a, that's a tricky thing to do. You need to be aware of whether or not the teaching aligns with the truth of Scripture. This is one of the reasons why God gifted the church with pastors and teachers to help you with this project. But remind yourself that it falls back to you. Beware of false prophets. He's, he's putting it on us, all of us. So it's not just my job to help sort this stuff out. It's on you to ensure that you're not listening to false teachers. But first off, check their teaching. Secondly, check their character, their attitude, their, their ethics. Look at the way in which they actually live their lives. In, in Galatians chapter 5, we're told that there's a fruit of the Spirit. And what does that look like? It looks like character qualities. So look at the, the character of those individuals, the way in which they're interacting with life. What, is, what does it look like if you were to come up close to them and see how they deal with the world? What kind of character do they exhibit? And then finally, look at the outcome. Look at the people who sit under their teaching. What kind of people are they? Look at their followers. And then ask yourself the question, would I want my kids hanging out with the followers of this teacher? Would I, want, would I even want to spend time with followers of, the, of this sort of teaching? And as I've interacted with false teaching, the, I think these three different things really are a good evaluative tool because when, when it comes down to it, false teaching, as Jesus is saying here, it, it will out itself. It will reveal itself. That, that fruit will be exposed. And if you, can, if you can examine it closely, you will be able to dis- determine whether or not it is good. And finally, we're told false teaching will be dealt with at the day of judgment, verses 19 and 20. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. 
So every tree that does not bear the good fruit that Jesus is talking about will be dealt with by God. So you do not want to align yourself to those teachings, obviously. You want to find teachers who are going to help you in this journey. So as we wrap up today, here's what we need to do. We've got a decision to make. Will you choose to enter the way of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ? There are only two paths. Which one are you planning to choose? Which one are you choosing today? Will you commit your life to walking out this discipleship pathway, even if it's incredibly hard? Will you resolve to follow the Lord through whatever it is that he's going to lead you along in this way of life? Will you make that decision today? And then we need to be aware that there are false teachers who are seeking to mislead us. They're seeking to get us off of this path. And we need to be wise then and discerning and and recognize that not everyone who claims to speak on behalf of God is actually going to help us. And this is such an important matter that we need to be incredibly careful because only one way leads to life with God. May we be found in that way. Let's pray. Lord, we're asking for your help right now. We're praying that by your spirit, you would give us discernment. Lord, I pray that all of us in here would be wrestling with the the reality of the choice that you're putting in front of us. That this Sermon on the Mount isn't just information to be taken in. It's actually an invitation to life change. So help us to surrender entirely to our Lord. Help us to entrust ourselves to him. Help us to enter through the gate that is Jesus Christ. And help us to walk on the path that he has set before us. Lord, help us to be wise about the teaching that we encounter. We're all being discipled. We're we're all constantly being shaped and molded by the information that we're taking in. Help us, Lord, to be wise and surround ourselves with voices that are true and faithful and good. Help us to do that, please, for your glory. Amen.